A few months ago, as some of you likely know, I made a short documentary all about Group B and its rise and fall. Briefly at the end, I mentioned Group S. I'd advise watching the full video to get a proper breakdown of the subject, but in essence, when Group B was no longer viable to keep running because of the deaths of both spectators and drivers, FISA shut the whole championship down. Group S prior to this had been planned to be brought in in 1988 to replace Group B. Homologation rules were lessened where 10 cars were required instead of 20 like in Group B, as well as focusing on making it cheaper for manufacturers to showcase innovations. Ultimately however, Group S was axed along with its older brother and so it was left in history. But upon the Group S rules being written in 1985, albeit in a draft form, a lot of manufacturers jumped on board pretty quickly. They began building prototypes of these Group S racers, but of course when the championship was terminated, the prototypes became a lot more valuable than what they were originally thought to be. We therefore have a collection of Group S rally cars that never truly saw the light of day, and are generally overshadowed by their Group B cousins. Today, let's take a look at these Group S cars, and how they changed from Group B. Toyota did have a presence in Group B, the Celica TCT. However, the TCT was rear wheel drive, thanks large in part to the fact that it was introduced in 1983 when it was the norm to build rear wheel drive rally cars. When four wheel drive became the norm in the next few years, the TCT faded away and isn't remembered that well. So when Group S was announced, Toyota wanted a fresh start and to turn over a new leaf. Enter the Toyota MR2 222D. This thing does look pretty similar to the regular counterpart until you take a closer look. For example, the width, which is now much wider to encompass wider tyre sizes and for better stability. Plus, the iconic pop-up headlights have been replaced with traditional fixed ones, as well as the addition of rally spotlights, which both improve aerodynamics. Two engines were also theorised to be in the 222D, a 2.1 litre 4T GTE which was used in the TCT and a 2.2 litre Group C prototype, which is apparently where the 222D name comes from, MR2 2.2 litre. Three twos. Power ranges were supposedly between 600 brake horsepower and 750 brake horsepower, and the 750 kilogram weight would have made the triple two a nippy little monster. Speaking of monster, this prototype was named the Black Monster, based on the fact that the black semi gloss paint made the car look very fierce and very angular. Eleven were reportedly built, but with crash tests and other events taking their course, only three remain today two black and one white. I'd take good care of them. Ford RS200S is a special story, the car never officially existed. While plans went fairly far with its design, Ford decided not to build any prototypes until later in development, which was probably a good thing in retrospect. Other than that, we know it was to feature a brand new gearbox, lighter bodywork, a remodelled intercooler and most jarringly, the removal of the protruding air duct from the roof of the car to improve aerodynamics. However, two decades after the demise of Group S, John Wheeler, a chief designer of the original RS200 and the RS200S, decided to bring the design to life with a specially built replica. First, he bought a moderately damaged Rallycross RS200 and replaced the bent rear end to have it be returned to better condition. Then, work was done to convert the original to the S model. A new wing was added and all the original changes were put into effect. Plus, the traditional BDT engine was replaced with a YB engine, which powered the Ford Escort Cosworth for a few years in the 1990s. It could supposedly do 485 brake horsepower, and the S was said to be around 90 kilograms lighter than the original. While not completely faithful to the original design as changes were seen here and there, this is no Frankenstein's monster. Peugeot was one of the most successful competitors in Group B, so it was a given that they would want to compete in Group S. 
Persia was originally going to go with something along the lines of what Ford did, as they were originally going to simply upgrade their successful 205. However, the 205 had a shorter wheelbase than what Peugeot wanted, and even with experimentation on elongated wheelbases, they couldn't get the 205 to work under this new structure. So they instead decided to take their brand new 405, which was released as a standard road going car in 1987. As well as having much better dimensions for what Peugeot wanted, building a rally version would make for some effective marketing. The team then adapted the 205 chassis and drivetrain for the new length, and the 405 prototype was born. As well as weighing a mere 880 kilograms, it also allowed for a larger fuel tank to be fitted. The 405 was much more versatile, the engine was also upgraded to a 1.9 litre. However, unlike other Group S prototypes which met the end of their official careers along with the championship, the 405 T16 actually went on to compete in the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb and managed a victory. It also made multiple appearances in heavily modified forms in rally raid events, with much larger reinforced suspension and a larger fuel tank. It managed to deliver Peugeot two wins in 1989 and 1990 in the Paris Dakar Rally. Peugeot was able to keep their T16 line of races in a competitive form for almost a decade, which isn't too bad. The 130LR was a moderately successful entry into Group B from Skoda. Skoda was intent on improving it, and when Group S was announced, Skoda only quickened their pace. Originally, however, Skoda planned to build a specially modified version of the upcoming Skoda Favorite, or however you pronounce it. But when the production of the Favorite was delayed, the team decided to refocus their efforts onto the already successful 130, now known as the 130LR Evo. Wider body kits and tyres were fitted, rear ducts were added for better rear ventilation, the rear spoiler became moulded into the body, the bonnet was fitted with an air vent to keep the radiator cool, and a lot of other things were added. Alterations were also made to the positioning of certain elements in the car to help balance out the drastic 40-60 weight ratio in the back of the car. The 1.2 litre engine was also a step up, and the 850kg weight was a huge improvement. The car was first tested here in July of 1986, and the car then did some races here and there after Group S was cancelled, being passed between different owners over the years. Multiple replicas of the Evo have been built, but other than that, not much is known. While these prototypes are all cool in their own right, there are two specific Group S cars that have become truly iconic, even outside of Group S. The first of which is the Audi Sport Quattro RS002. This car should never have truly existed. The prototype was actually built in secrecy without the knowledge of higher ups and even the chairman of Audi. In short, a lot of the team knew that the front engine Audi Quattro would not be able to survive for long. While it was great on fast straights and corners, slower corners became a problem thanks to the understeer, due large in part to the engine being mounted over the front axle. Mid-engined was the way to go. So they began building these prototypes in complete secrecy, and test runs were planned to be taken on dirt roads near Salzburg in Austria. But when the press were tipped off, Audi ran for the border to find somewhere else to test the car. Supposedly, Audi's star racer, Walter Roll, could tell almost immediately that the mid-engine Quattro was much faster than the old one. Few pictures remain of this secret prototype. The most notable thing on the car, however, is the telltale ducts added to the side. But the backlash meant that the mid-engine project had to be dismantled pretty quickly. But another prototype had been made. This one looked radically different to the traditional Quattro design, and three were produced. While one was destroyed and another one remains on static display in the museum, one is unaccounted for, which from what I can gather, means that there's still one roaming in the wild. This prototype had very smooth styling and a freakishly large wing, and to many looked more like a Group C car, but <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Then, for the 30th anniversary of the final year of Group B, the RS002 was restored and has since been touring, with Rawl occasionally taking the wheel of the car he tested all those years ago. <laughs> Then there's what is considered the poster child for Group S, the Lancia ECV and all its variants. 
Even before Group B was banned, the Delta was undergoing major improvements to make it more competitively viable, upgrading the reliability and performance of the gearbox and engine, rebuilding the front suspension, shifting the centre of weight were all things on the list, but most importantly was the improvement of the aerodynamics, a particular fault of the original S4. Side skirts and a retractable flap under the front bumper were considered to be used, but when Group B was cancelled, the project, which was codenamed SEO 40 was cancelled. But with the prospect of Group S, a new project was started called ECV, which stands for Experimental Composite Vehicle. A lot of the technical innovations from the previous project were brought over, and the resulting car was shown off at the 1986 Bologna Motor Show. Because of the 10 car requirement for homologation, Lancia was able to include some expensive innovations, with a large part of the body being constructed out of carbon fibre. The chassis, for example, also made large in part out of carbon fibre, was 20% lighter than the steel chassis from the S4, while being just as stable. It even supposedly used computer assisted design in its conception, a brand new technology which had only ever been seen in Formula 1 up to this point. The engine also saw some relative changes, with a design that had the turbochargers turn off at different speeds. So, at low speeds only one turbo would be functional, but as the speed rose, the second turbo would slowly kick in. This meant the engine would work well at low rev ranges, and could do 600 brake horsepower. The ECV also featured the aerodynamics from the SEO 40 with side skirts, a rear diffuser, single headlights, a roof spoiler and side scoops all making an appearance. The project was well liked and stayed pretty close to the original vision of Group S, a car that would show off the groundbreaking innovations in lightweight chassis and power. That's not all however, we have the ECV2. It had the same chassis and engine as the first ECV, but the body was wildly different, like what the RS002 was to the original mid-engine Quattro. Straying away from the sharp, almost boxy designs of recent Lancia cars, the body featured a lot of curves and was much more compact. While they were revolutionary in the original car, when the second turbo kicked in, the car had a huge boost of power, which was supposedly uncontrollable, so the ECV2 had smaller turbos. However, due to the ECV2 having the same chassis and engine as the original, and to save cost by not building more, the first ECV had to be dismantled in order to build the ECV2. But on the flip side, a replica of the first ECV was built in 2010 using a standard Lancia Delta S4 Stradale, and now the two ECV brothers stand proud as a monument to Group S. I could go on. There are a multitude of other Group S prototypes that I haven't covered, such as the Mazda RX-7S, the Seat Ibiza Bimotor and the Opel Cadet E4S. If you'd like me to cover these cars, I would be happy to make part 2, but I think the cars I covered today were the foundation blocks of Group S and what it could have been. Lightweight, more powerful and generally some of the best looking cars of the decade, there's no better place to look for crazy cars than the world of the Group S prototype. Thanks for watching. I'd also like to give my thanks to the Group B Shrine, a website dedicated to uncovering all of the details about Group B and Group S. Most if not all of the info presented here today in this video were from them, so if you'd like to learn more about any specific car you've seen in this video, or anything else on the subject, be sure to check them out. Thanks again.